Attention, please be advised that by your entry upon these premises, you are consenting to being photographed and to having your likeness used in motion pictures and other purposes. Chips? In 1975, what was going on here? This was not a big rock and roll town. It was pre-punk. Wow, really? After the 60s blew up, everything died down? Yeah. So actually, we saw Bowie driving around in a beat-up old VW Bug. Eventually, we found out, oh, he's here recording. We tracked him down to Cherokee Studios. He was making station to station. Go there every day. It was, we saw him get out of the car and walk in. He dropped a cigarette, a jeton cigarette. I mean, we... That's actually my first fake name. And uh, it's so bad to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> shitty to say. Was there a last name or is that the whole no, name? No, that was the whole name. Jeton? Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. and he dropped the cigarette butt and we ran to grab it. And Darby put it in a little tiny, like, vial thing and put on a chain and wore it around his neck. Darby was already writing. He's writing lyrics. And, and so one day he did a bunch of writings and he stuck it on the windshield of his car. On Bowie's uh, car. Yeah. And got a fucking letter back complimenting his writing and urging him to go on and do this. And that was kind of the idea of, like, what are you fucking doing, man? Pre germs? Yeah. Bowie wrote Darby a letter. Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh my god. Dear stalkers. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, we're moving right along here. We got a few more to go. Let's welcome, if you will, the germs.
What shall we talk about? Oh, of course, the germs. Well, it all started for me in 1977 in Phoenix, Arizona, when I heard the germs single it was called For Me. The B side was called Sex Boy. And the forming side was all right. It was kind of amusing. And uh, then the phone rang. It was the weirdest fucking thing. Hello? That was the foxy 15-year-old from Laguna with the purple bud. Anyway, she says hi. Um, so, the B-side of the forming single it was recorded on a cassette in somebody's pocket in their pea coat or something. It was one of the most hideous things I'd ever heard. It was probably the worst or the best thing I'd ever heard in my life. I couldn't really tell which. And I called those guys. I got their phone numbers, Darby and Pat, and called them, told them that I was just starting to play drums and I was probably good enough for them. And <laughs> I was uh, thinking of moving to Los Angeles and I would like to be their drummer. And I asked them what kind of things they were into musically. And I, I was really into kraut rock and all this really esoteric stuff like Stockhausen and you know, various electronic and avant music. And I like the Velvet Underground and that whole bulk of stuff. And of course, kraut rock bands like Faust, Noi, and uh, Cluster especially. Uh, <clears throat> and I loved the, the punk rock stuff that was coming out, the weird stuff like, you know, Chelsea, The Lurkers, uh, The Subway Sect, uh, Eater, I don't know, just anything. It wasn't much then, but whatever there was, you know, Perry Ubu. And I said, so what are you guys into? They, I ran down this list of things that I, I liked that were like that. And they said, well, we're not, I don't really know about any of that. <clears throat> but, well, and Pat said, we're really into, really into like, Queen. I said, what? And, and he goes, yeah, and yes. I was like, whoa, and he was oh, David Bowie. Like, okay, then I called uh, Darby, who was Bobby Pin then, and told him about the same thing. And he said, yeah, well, at all those people you named, I, I know Brian Eno, but mostly I like David Bowie, and that's about it. And uh, I guess I kind of like uh, the Sex Pistols, but you know, and I'm like, whoa, that's the weirdest thing. So I couldn't, you know, and he liked Queen too, you know. It's it like, it really was perplexing, but, you know, undaunted, I got my measly $1,200 trust fund. Really, that's not much as far as trust funds go. And um, I got a Chrysler Newport Custom. It's one of the longest cars ever made. If you ever see Cremaster 3, you, you, uh, the Chrysler Newport Custom that I got was much larger than the Chrysler Imperials that were in that. So um, I got in that, threw a drum set in there, moved to Los Angeles. And uh, with Rob Graves in the car, we moved here. And we went to the Elks Lodge to see the Mask Benefit, which is where the germs were performing, after stopping at the Plunger Pit. Uh, the Plunger Pit was where everyone stayed when they were in town. Sid Vicious stayed there. <clears throat> I mean, people, people just would stay there when they were around. But there was these four girls called the Plungers. There was Trudy Argrela, uh, there was Mary Rat, and uh, Trixie, something or other, and probably someone else. And <laughs> I, I'm sure I'll remember it eventually. Maybe it was Alice Bag. I don't know. No, it wasn't Alice Bag. But it, um, I'm sure it'll come to me eventually. That was a long time ago. And it's in the book, so I guess I could always look it up so I don't feel it too important to remember it. Um, but the plunger pit was uh, stopped at, clothes changed, the Elks Lodge mask benefit with a million bands that played at the mask was attended and that was my first sighting of the germs with Nikki beat on drums I was kind of worried eh, this guy's pretty good um, then in the elevator I was accosted by all these people with bands and that were managers of bands because they had heard that this guy this crazy nut was coming out from Phoenix all the way from Phoenix to play drums with this joke of a band the germs so they all tried to there was a, a terrible drummer shortage <clears throat> well, actually, no shortage of terrible drummers. Well, yeah, there was even a shortage of those. But they all asked me to be in their bands or their project bands or their clients' band or whatever. And I just 
said, no, I was here to, I'm here to join the germs. These guys were like, what, are you kidding? These guys are just nothing, they're horrible, they're a joke. Uh, we have management and uh, uh, interest and, and uh, this song on the radio and this. And I said, look, I don't care, I, you know, maybe I'll do it as a side thing, but I'm, I'm here to join the germs. And then I hadn't even been accepted as a member of the band yet, but I moved into the Canterbury Apartments and uh, it was really cheap. It was like a hundred something a month for a studio apartment in this rundown building with these like black people on PCP running around in the halls, like taking people's guitars and setting fires and stuff. Sometimes you'd find these weird bums sleeping in the hallway and make salads on them with all the various cleaning uh, items and uh, food stuffs and garbage and bodily excrement sort of things from the uh, house. It was good fun. But the mask, which was right nearby, so it was a convenient place for all the punk rockers to live. Some of the germs lived there. The, well, Lorna lived there, and I lived there. And we had to drive to, to germs practice. Well, actually, we hung out in the mask in the daytime. It was a rehearsal studio, because they'd stopped having shows when I moved here. Um, and we still hung out in the basement, which is what the mask was, in the daytime. And that's where I, I would hang out with Pat and learn the songs on bass so I could sort of think about them and learn them on drums in my head. And it was just something to do anyway. And I'd jam with other bands there, like the Skulls and the Controllers and such. Um, watch Joan Jett have fights with her girlfriend on Quaaludes. They'd be beating the hell out of each other, chasing each other around the mask basement, and just yelling these horrible things at you know, each other and grabbing each other by the hair and kicking the shit out of the other one. It was, it was a good time. But the mask, um, unfortunately, as a venue, was over. Although it stayed around as a rehearsal place long enough for me to audition for the germs, which I did in <clears throat> about three inches of urine, water, beer, and whatever it was in that restroom. Um, I set up the drums, a stolen sonar kit from Phoenix that a friend of mine found in his yard was going to sell me for a hundred bucks. And then I just sort of moved here with it in the car and forgot to pay him. Um, it was kind of an accident. Sorry about that, Stuart. <laughs> However, um, the, the drums fit neatly in the cubicle where the toilet once was in the mask bathroom, as did various members of the germs as they um, watched horrified while I played some kind of avant uh, Cecil Taylor on drums kind of uh, freak out thing. And they just sort of looked at me and said, I think Pat said, uh, could you like play a song? I said, oh, okay. Well, luckily, Nicky Beat, who I had befriended, he was, it was unavoidable, he was a friendly guy. Nicky Beat was also a good drummer. He was the drummer in the Weirdos and the fill-in drummer for the Germs since they didn't really have a drummer. Um, and he, he had uh, acquiesced to give me a couple of drum lessons. I'd only been playing for a couple of months, even though I'd been in a band in Phoenix playing drums. It was pretty brutal in Caveman. Actually, probably the best drumming I ever did before I learned to play. But um, Nicky taught me how to play Life of Crime by the Weirdos on drums, and then he taught me some other thing. And then, I guess, I had to read this in the book to remember it. And Nicky said, uh, and then he told me to that you couldn't take lessons with me anymore because mistakes were part of punk rock and I was teaching you how to not make mistakes and you couldn't, and you didn't think that was right. <laughs> I don't remember saying that, but I'm sure I thought that. I, of course, that's, you know, otherwise, why would I have ever thought that I could get away with any of this stuff? Uh, you know, because obviously none of it mattered. So there I was uh, in the mass bathroom. The germs all went out in the other room and deliberated for a moment. And it was a tense minute there while I waited. And finally, Darby and Pat and Lori came back and said, well, you're a germ. And that was it.
They wanted the germs, they got it. So tell me a little bit about Darby Crash uh, from the Germs and some of your experiences with him. Well, Darby was the type he was had stage fright. It was almost like he didn't really want to be doing what he was doing. And to make up for that, to compensate for that lack of wanting to be on stage, he would drink and do drugs. And that would uh, loosen him up and make it easier for him to get up there and do some of the things that he did. Uh, there were a few people that were like that. I was like that. In the beginning, it was like, you know, we would drink and do cocaine and wow. snort speed and it was terrible. I mean, I did it and I had fun doing it at times. There were a lot of ugly times, but I don't do it anymore. I don't need to, I don't want to. Was Darby like a, a good person when you hung out with him? Did you guys get along? I, mean, I always got along with Darby. Darby was, um, as much as he stood out amongst all the people, he always still, the vibe that I got from him was that he wanted to like be one of the guys. 
or hang with all the gals or, you know, whoever was there. He would, you know, want to be a part of whatever what was going on. Do you feel he was a misunderstood person? I don't think so. He made great records. He was an awesome lyricist. Um, I don't think they really got the recognition they deserved, but then they weren't around long enough. They only made the one album, you know, and whatever bootlegs came out. Yeah. So it was like we never really got a chance to see just how far they could go, if they would become better musicians, if they would write, uh, you know, what direction they would go with the music. How did you feel about his passing? Well, I was sad, but it was almost like, in a way, we saw it coming. Or not we, but I, you know, felt something was going to happen because he was just, he was running too hard. He was yeah. running too fast. Being in that scene, the punk scene, were you really allowed to, like, say, hey, man, you know, you need to slow down? Or, or was that just not, a, not an option? Well, the thing was that a lot of us were moving fast like that. So there was a bit of like, uh, I'm not going to worry so much about him. Uh -huh. I'm not going to worry so much about her. Ladies and gentlemen, from the garages of LA, the church. We have a few friends for you to meet. Mercury recording artist Joan Jett of The Runaways. And we have with us tonight The Germs performing at the Whiskey. What are you guys going to do tonight? The same stuff we always do. And what is that specifically? It gets cut up a lot. New Wave promoter Rodney Bingenheimer. What kind of future do you see for punk rock? Well, it's going to last for a while. I mean, punk rock has always been here when, when a truck driver when I stepped into a studio in Memphis and started cutting That's All Right Mama, Elvis <laughs> Presley. A lot of it would seem strange to your average music fan. Maybe somebody who likes Chicago, maybe somebody who likes Captain and Tennille, that sort of stuff. How would you explain punk rock to them? I would tell them to pick up some of the local punk rock fanzines such as Slash, um, Raw Power, Backdoor Man, all those magazines that kids are now putting out themselves under their own expense. And they explain pretty much what is happening. Right. What kind of money is behind this stuff? Not very much. It's pretty much on the street situation. Right. What do you think about John Bowles? Oh, he's right. John Bowles fucked my girlfriend. When I was, like, my first girlfriend that I had that I was totally in love with. We were both really big Germs fans, and we met him at the Cafe de Grand in a punk rock show. We were really excited because it was Don Bowles, and I thought he was talking to me because, like, you know, he thought I was a good bass player or something, but he really just wanted to fuck my girlfriend. And, like, a week later, he went out with my girlfriend, 
and he took her to the bat caves up in front of the She came back, she had like scratches all over her back. Big scratch marks. And I was like, what the fuck is that? And she said, uh, she was like, oh, you know, I was running up with Don Balls, but I, I didn't fuck him or anything. And he told me later that, that uh, he did fuck her. And she told me that she did it too. And um, it was really fucked that he did that, you know. But, uh, you know, that's Don Balls for you. Did you ever see the Germans? Um, no, I tried to see the Germans once, the last show at the Starwood, and I couldn't get in. I was like hanging out outside trying to get in. You know, yeah, well, I feel like, like the Germans is like, such a spiritual thing and something that moves me so much and when I listen to the live records and I can sit in the room and it's really dark and I close my eyes I feel like I'm like taking part in some kind of weird sacred ritual just by doing that you know so I can imagine if you're if I was really into it seeing them it would have been really intense because I feel like um whenever I can talk to someone who likes the germs is like I feel like like the germs aren't the kind of band that you just kind of like because they're cool or something it's like you love them and it's like this really deep intense thing you can relate to someone about or you don't give a shit about them at all, you know, because you like a, an insensitive fool or whatever. But I love them so much, and um, to me, Darby Crash is, is like not just probably the greatest rock lyricist of all time, but just like one of the greatest poets of all time, period. Like, I mean, like as heavy as in like fucking Rambo or Allen Ginsberg Howell or any of that shit, you know? Like reading that lyric sheet and listening to that record is, is, um, is just an intense thing. It's unlike, um, any other thing, especially in rock music, it's unlike any other thing that's deep. Do you remember your first exposure to music, what the situation was? Yeah, the first time I was, I, I had joined, like, I didn't know anything about punk rock, and I um, joined the band Fear, just because I guess I just kind of, like, naturally had that, like, kind of punk rock energy in me, but not knowing anything about it, and I joined the band Fear, and um, I was hanging out with, with them somewhere, and, and the germs were on, and I was like, what the fuck is that? What is that? And they're like, oh, that's the germs, that's no good. Like, they didn't like the germs, they thought, they were like, oh, they don't know how to play good, and that's, you know, it's the germs. And I was like, I was kind of like, like, wanted them to like me and stuff, so I was like, yeah, yeah, but what is that? And I went out and bought the record, like, the next day, and took it home, and I remember just sitting there with the headphones and the, the album sleeve, the GI album sleeve, and it just, like, blew my mind and changed my life, literally changed my whole attitude towards music totally changed my idea about what music was and I think that's like when I first realized like what rocking out was what it meant to to um, rock out in a band and do something really cool with those things to the germs like that record really changed me secret right yeah. from Phoenix, Arizona, just to join the Germs. And I called them up, I got their number from a friend. Apparently they were having drummer trouble in LA, and the Germs especially were having drummer trouble. They originally had Belinda Carlisle, they met Belinda and Lorna uh, Doom, uh, who was the bass player, um, at the same time, and they were both gonna join the band. Mm -hmm. And they all met in the lobby of the Beverly Hilton, waiting for Queen to get there from a gig. Wow. Yeah, and I think it was 76. Yeah. <laughs> and um, when did punk hit LA? Like, oh, probably 77. So wait, but this was 76? Yeah. So. And they, they started in 76, but like, like they didn't late, really do later shit. 76, yeah. yeah. And, um, <clears throat> but there was always proto-punk going on. There was like street rock, is what it was called. And, and uh, there were magazines, and like Backdoor Man and Bomb. 77's kind of late. I would have thought Yeah, like, we didn't, well, it happened a little later here. LA, yeah, LA was always behind kind of everyone else. Like, the 80s it's was really place. where a lot of, you know, like Black Flag is probably like the LA punk band of all time. I suppose, but that's only because they toured. Yeah. They took it around. The yeah. Germs never did that. And Darby died young. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but I mean, we did, <clears throat> we could barely go to San Francisco and play a show, you know. It was yeah. just too much 
too much trouble. <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, so I moved here to join the Germs. I called them up because I just started playing drums. I said, hey, my name's Don Bowles, and I'm uh, going to move to L.A., and I'll play drums for your band if you like. Well, okay. You know, um, I've been playing for like two weeks. <laughs> you know, pretty good, though. And they're, all right. And then I, Darby told me every sexual indiscretion and quirk of everybody that I didn't know in L.A. <laughs> and uh, it was really hilarious. It's a total gossip queen. And then I'm, I'm asking Pat, like, because I heard the, the, that forming single. It was really strange, and the lyrics were really cool. And the B-side was like Throbbing Gristle or something. And I was like, do you guys like, uh, uh, you know, like... I forget who you know who I said like uh, uh, all, Kraut Rock. You know you like Faust. You like Noi. You know and and they're like no, never heard of that. Okay, um, Vandergraaf Generator. Oh, I saw their records in the cutout bin once. They have weird covers. Okay, what do you like? Um, you like Subway Sec, the weird out of the way punk things. Never heard of that. Oh, huh. Uh, they'd heard of Eno because he was in Roxy music that they'd heard of. And I go, well, what do you guys like? And, and Pat says, well. I like Yes and Queen really? and, and David Bowie and Darby said almost the same thing. Queen, David Bowie and Oldies. Wow. Yeah. Wow. His sister was a cholo. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so I was like, these, are, these guys are either putting me on or they're the weirdest people ever because they don't know that they sound like pure, like crazy noise. And yeah. We, the weirdest shit on earth. They think they're normal. I'm like, whoa. So, well, that's how you know that they're actually like. They were for real. They're for they real. Yeah. And then I moved here. They're not here. trying to be someone else. They're, they're, yeah. It's authentic. And then I moved here with Rob, and he joined the bags, and, and uh, I, I was going to join the Germs Night. And we, the first thing we did was we, we got here in time for uh, the Mask Benefit show at the Park Plaza, and all the bands were playing. It was like every band in LA. You know, the Dills, the Germs, the Bags, the Screamers, you know, e Dickies, everybody. And I'm in like the elevator and somebody, I guess the Germs had the biggest mouths in Los Angeles because everybody knew I was the guy from Phoenix that had moved there to play drums with the Germs. And so all these people, because since there was a drummer shortage, hit me up to play for their band. Yeah. You, know, you got to play with, with us. The germs are a joke. They're not going anywhere. They're terrible. Nobody likes them. Well, some people like them, but I don't know why. And I'm like, you haven't heard me. I probably, I suck. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, believe me, you don't want me in your band. I, I just started playing drums two weeks ago and I'm terrible. Germs yeah. already had the reputation for having wild Show. Oh yeah, their their shows were like food fights, yeah, you know, and chaos. Was it like ever like anxiety provoking? Like like before that, it's like you're. It's almost like you're about to get into a boxing match, you know. Well, it you're was behind a drum kit, that. so it was like weirder than that. You're kind that of was protected by the drum. Well, kit. that was before I was I was in the band that it was like that. So it was more wild and chaotic and, and violent before you were in the well, band. Well, I wouldn't say violent. It was just ridiculous. Yeah. It wasn't violent, really. I mean. There was the violence compared to what later happened in in the hardcore scene was minimal. There wasn't much actual violence. It was sort of the the feel and the look of violence more than it was violence. People pogoing, you know. But if someone fell down, people would help them up. Oh, okay. You know? Instead of like later, they, if someone fell down, they'd kick the shit out of them with their boots. Yeah. That that was it. Wasn't like that. <clears throat> and you know, everyone was gay or a girl, or weird, you know? And Pat was actually uh, multiracial. Yeah, well you said that the, uh, the scene back then, it wasn't cool to like sex. Yeah, I mean. That's, that's, that's unique. Yeah, that was, that what, was how punk kind of was. What, what do you sex mean? Sex was stupid, that was for hippies, you know? That was sex like was stupid. Peace and love stuff, you know? So like people were like, like chased? No. Mm, sorta. Well also, you know, it definitely made the pain of Nobody wanted to have sex with the weirdo punk rockers that they didn't understand. Got it. it. Made that a little less bad. Oh, I've been talking. Oh, yeah,
guys come up too? one of the older bands too, weren't we? Like, like in, by 1980. We were the youngest band, then we were the oldest band. It yeah. was weird, it took, just took a couple of years. <laughs> it didn't become this thing like it became later. It was, every band was completely different and yeah. what we called punk rock then, nobody would, today no one says, Go Go is punk rock, Evo punk rock, Scream is punk rock, but back it then was all did. punk rock back then. And we'd all be on the same Harry goal. Ubu was punk rock, you know, this, all, all these disparate things were punk and rock. And that was kind of what was so cool about a punk show, was you didn't know what you were going to see. Now you go to a punk show and it's like, all right, it comes with black leather jackets and bar cords and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, we kind of had to invent it. And what I think what we were doing was a little more like uh, really crazy, uh, heavy, progressive glam. You know, it was like, it was like more out of... The Runaways and Bowie, you know, it was, like, it was very, very Spiders from Mars and Runaways. Like, I hadn't heard of The Runaways. One of the earliest scenes that we were really interested in was the L.A. punk scene. And then the Germs album came out, and that record was hugely significant for us, and Joan had produced it. Oh, wait a minute, that's the I Love Rock and Roll person. Like, that's crazy that she produces record. We have a few friends for you to meet. Mercury recording artist Joan Jett of The Runaways. And we have with us tonight the Germs performing at the Whiskey. What are you guys going to do tonight? The same stuff we always do. The Germs, they were a pretty infamous L.A. punk band. It leads to a Darby crash, and the guitar player, Pat Smear, were huge Runaways fans. Eventually, they start this band called the Germs, and they're, you know, hardcore punk. 
Darby was some kind of crazed Colonel Kurtz-like shaman of, of teenage people. It must have been 79 at some point before I moved. They asked if, you know, if I would produce an album. And I'm figuring, you know, they think I know what I'm doing because I've made a couple albums with the Runaways. She didn't engineer. That wasn't her thing. Had a great sensibility. She's like, ah, I think you got to tune the guitar, Pat. It was a no frills album, but just straight up punk rock. I was very proud of the record. We needed someone with ears and someone with a rock and roll heart, you know, in there um, helping us make a good record. And she did that, by gosh. She knew how to get us to do the things. And I think the last, the last day I partied too much and passed out on the couch, with, which Darby documents in one of the songs. singing that kept it from being radio friendly also made it so every generation of 15 year olds rediscovers the germs it's real you know and you can't mistake it you instantly realize darby's lyrical content because you get this on, on vinyl that's who, the lyrics were in there that he was a, a genius and a poet but you couldn't understand a word he was saying that was kind of a new thing too I'll tell you, they were a fun band, but live, they were kind of messy. They had an opportunity to make an album, and I think it was Darby asked me if I would produce it. I didn't do much, it's just make sure you get everything down and make everything sound equal. That was my first production and my first chance to do something for another band like that. People loved the germs back then. And yeah, they went out on stage and sometimes stayed there for five minutes and left. The whole premise of that movement was to do things contrary to the norm. Hardcore was born out of that punk rock movement and it is very different music, very, very different. You know, not so artsy fartsy and uh, very uncompromising. Since we're here, we're in your living room. Pat Smear, first show you saw the Roxy. Come on now. Here's a little trivia for you. Cheech and Chong's Up in Smoke, the movie, right? Battle of the Bands scene. The Germs, Pat Smear's band. But did you sit out in the alley waiting to be in the thing? The Germs were the only band cut from Up in Smoke, you guys. Come on. That's better than being in the movie. Germs don't mess around. Why do you think Darby Crash has become such an iconic figure in the history of punk rock? Well, I think because that's what he wanted. <laughs> he, um, he was a really amazing guy. He was really, really smart. He um, understood philosophy and sociology and decided that he wanted to do something. And, you know, 
saw it through and for some of us we really saw the human side of him as well and um, I don't know I <laughs> just kind of you know everything happens for a reason and it just kind of rolled along his short books about Darby it says that he had this charisma to create a following to have people follow him and give me a beer yeah. You know, and like he could just snap his yeah. fingers and people yeah. would do, he didn't have to say, give me a beer because it was just yeah. give me a beer and people would do it. to work at it sometime though. I mean, not everybody would just, you know, roll over and give Darby what he wanted, you know, and, but he was, he was very funny. He was, I mean, he was the funniest person on earth and he would, you know, make everybody laugh around him and, and. You just kind of wanted to do stuff, you know, I, I felt like it was a family, like, you know, he was part of my family and I felt um, comfortable with him because he taught me to be myself no matter what other people said or thought, you know. I mean, we were the first people at uni with blue hair and, you know, got a lot of shit for that. You know, but we took it because we were doing something that we knew um, was different and we, you know, gave us something to kind of live for, but unfortunately it didn't end up that way for everybody. Tell me about the first time you met Darby. Well, I had seen him many times in Westwood and I went to uni high, as did he, and um, he had been kicked out of school I spent a lot of time watching him and Pat wandering around school with my friend Bambi, who will be here tonight, and she was a very good friend of Darby's too, and we called him the snake guy because he was just intriguing to us, and sometimes he had green hair, and you know, he had his chipped tooth, and he just, you know, we just found him incredibly charismatic, you know, when I was in 10th grade, you know, it just amazing. That aside, uh, my dear friend Dinky Bonebreak, who was Dinky Grant at the time, I also went, she went to uni as well, and we were in journalism together, and um, she just said to me one day, you know, you have got to meet Paul, you guys will love each other. And, you know, the minute I walked into his room, filled with David Bowie and everything, I mean, I just felt so at home, you know, and I, and I, I really feel like he, um, he was kind of a big brother to me, and considering all of the um, stuff that he kind of took, the journey that we went on, um, I still felt like he protected me, and he gave me a home, and he um, he taught me a lot in the few years that you know that we got to, I got to know him. Tell me some highlights, some light life changing highlights of your time with Darby. Well, I mean, there's the infamous decline story where we were partying at my house one night and we discovered a dead body and then that kind of you know became infamous I guess on decline and it's a little bit embarrassing because you know I was a pretty brash 17 year old or whatever but that was that was a big night because somebody died in my backyard and there he was there was Darby to um joke around about it and like get through and we did not have anything to do with the death by the way no i know he had a heart attack and <laughs> fell off the ladder right something I, yeah he had been drinking for sure there was a there was a bottle on the ground chris ashford was the germs first um do whatever he could possibly do and he put out their first single forming which was la's first punk rock single and he worked at Lipkish Pizza and he used to let us like go in there and just hang out all the time and be the obnoxious kids that we were. And we lived together for a short amount of time in Hollywood and I remember at the apartment that we lived together, um, Bambi came over <laughs> and hung out one night and he, Darby was so funny. I mean, this is, this will probably sound lame in an interview, but we were, you know, trying to go to sleep or whatever, and he came in the house, and he just started jumping on the bed. He just wanted to, us to get up and play with him, you know, and just, that's who he was. He was really playful and, and wonderful and smart, and, and, you know, he was an asshole, too, but he was never an asshole to me, you know. Really? Never. You know, I mean, I'm sure he said things to make me 
wake up, you know. I thought his story is really important to tell. I also would love to say, because I don't know if I'll ever have another chance to say this, but I'm so grateful to Darby for giving the scene a home, really, and a name and a face. And um, I'm just grateful to him for having existed, and I wish that he hadn't thrown in the towel. I think he had his reasons for doing it. And, and, and you don't know why? Well, I don't think anybody knows for sure. Really? I think that, um, I don't think that he saw himself as a grown-up. I don't think he could picture himself past 22 years old. You know, I thought that, that I think that he made a plan. He wanted to become a rock star. And by the time he, um, he had gotten notoriety, he um, did what he wanted to do, and maybe had his life been a really happy life, he wouldn't have killed himself, but I think he wanted to create a legacy, which he obviously did, and I think that he just kind of wanted to see Phoenix rising out of the ashes, you know, and I think that he wanted to be, he wanted everybody in the world to know him, you know, and I don't know if everybody in the world will get to know him, but at least some people will get to know him now. You guys, you're not having fun. Do damage. Do damage.
dollars a bottle. Can you believe this tacky whore? Just do it there. Do it, do it from the kneeling position. That's more appropriate. <laughs> GI record is one that I've always stuck with. A lot of those other punk records, I I just can't listen to them anymore. They just don't hold my interest anymore. They don't mean the same things to me that a lot of those records did at the time, you know? There's a few that do. That record, the GI record, uh, Stooges records, uh, Suck Thistles, I can still listen to that. And uh, um, uh, a lot of the other ones. Yeah, Damage, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that would, I, you know, for me coming from up in the, in the Northwest, I kind of lumped all those bands together, you know. I just kind of let L.A. music, and I kind of, after I was into the, uh, I originally got into like the English punk bands in the late 70s, and after that, I feel like I kind of graduated to the L.A. punk bands. I was like a little, a little more, uh, it, was, it was a little more, like my friends that I would play, I could, I could play some of my friends like a Sex Pistols record, and they would go, uh, I'm not into the vocals, it's, it's, it's weird, but they could kind of get into it a little bit. If I played them the Damage record, the GI record, it'd just be, that stuff is just wrong, man. No way, you know, that, that, I can't listen to that at all. That, that is just, that's just wrong. It's just, there's nothing good about that. What is that, you know? That is just, there's nothing, nothing about that I like, nothing, you know? And uh, I kind of feel, feel like I had to get warmed up to that kind of stuff. And, you know, and I didn't really know what they said. It's, and, you know, I heard uh, Dez talking earlier about the lyrics to the, you know, the, the Germs, uh, Darby's lyrics, and I really, uh, you know, I remember I was really quite surprised at the, uh, the lyrical content, and I thought that it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, if, if you classified punk rock lyrics, I always classified them as kind of sophomoric, uh, idiotic poetry, sort of, you know? I would class, classify the germs in a poetic sense uh, a little bit higher on the scale of where, you know, punk rock uh, lyrics lie. Right? They kind of interested me in sort of a, I mean, you know, I've never, I've never considered people like Morrison poets myself, you know, I mean, uh, you know, like, like what are you going to say, Morrison 
Rollins, you know, Longfellow. I mean, I just, I never, I never, I never, I never quite was taken in by that, you know, I mean. So, I thought his lyrics, though, were okay. They were good. They kind of interested me, and I liked the fact that he wasn't, fuck the cops, or anything like that, you know. And, uh, uh, which I thought had been so overdone by that point, and just kind of old, you know, old hat to me that his, his lyrics, especially like, the Manimal, the song Manimal, which is probably my favorite germ song, I just like the fact that it was, he was keeping it really personal, you know, just like, I'm this, I'm that, not like, the world is fucked up, you know what I mean, like, I'm, this is how, the, you know, this is how I feel, you know, which was, which was really simple and good and easy to understand, and, and, it was nice, it was good, I mean, I could read his lyrics and not just go, eh, I could kind of go, wow, this is kind of cool, this guy, I perceive him as a drunken idiot, but there's more to it than that, you know. And I, I liked that. I really, I really admired that. And, and to this day, like I said, I can still listen to the GI record and enjoy it. That's 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 a real weird. That's a really weird concept to me, you know. <laughs> I got burned by the germ. Um, when was the first time you heard the germs? Oh man, I don't know. That's hard to say. Um, first time I ever heard the germs, I don't know, uh, where, where 81, I lived up uh, about 150 miles southwest of Seattle, germs never played up there. How did you hear of them? Um, it was difficult, uh, they were, uh, they were on a relatively big label, you know, especially the GI record. Seven Inches and stuff like that were, I know a few people that had that stuff. But uh, the GI record is the only one of the records I ever owned, you know. And I was never really much of a record collector. next to you. At least get them jumping. The, the next one's for Liz Belsa. Thank you. 
Phantom secret glimmers Body knocking in the sand Now I'm nothing but I know it's good You're out and crazy just like I know Between the stars, we will play. Yeah. But the time No, I'm nothing but. of your personalities at the time. Although you were a fan of Queen and David Bowie when you first started off and you learned a lot of Yes stuff on your guitar, right? That's right. Yeah, so you were, you were a big fan of progressive rock and glam. Totally. I was trying to play like them. It just didn't come out that way because I wasn't good enough. But I really was trying to play like all my favorite guitar <coughs> players. I mean, what else can you do? Why do you feel that Darby felt that he had a five-year plan and that he had to commit suicide. I mean, your last show apparently was amazing. Why was he so bent on self-destruction? I just think he, he, his five-year plan coincided with the fact that he was really fucked up and not happy, and so... And then he did hair, you know, he did sense. drunk and then heroin, and those things yeah. made people but, serious. I mean, it had he been stuff, happy, first. had a good, happy life at the time, he probably would have laughed and said, I was just fucking with you. He was a really funny guy, so too. It's think ironic. Deep seated emotional <clears throat> issues that actually led him to ultimately kill himself. They're better, Ben. That plus it, it went with the plan, so it all works out well. A lot of kids look up to Darby Crash and they may say, hey, my hero did this. This is something I should indulge in also. I think overall most people can say it's not a yeah, good thing. That's kind of part of the message that we have in common with Queen is uh, don't try suicide. This is from Bedazzled. Suicide? No, no, really. That's the last thing you should do. Uh, what do you think Darby would, would say right now if he was here about all of the success? Fuck. I think there'd be a sneer and a snicker. Yeah. He'd I, say something funny. Though. Oh, yeah, he would say something so funny that none of us can think of it.
that's a germs burn, and it was administered by Melissa in Redondo Beach. One night while her, I, and Darby were drinking and watching television and listening to music, Melissa was, I guess, part of the South Bay chapter of the, the Germs Society. And we, we, we'd hang, and Darby would come down to the South Bay occasionally. He came down when Black Flag was living in the bathhouse. We had a party down there one night, and he came down and was, uh, I guess Tr Trudy might have come down because she, Trudy and Paul, lived in uh, Torrance or Palos Verdes or one of those places. <clears throat> but I hung out with, I guess my most memorable time with Darby was when we hung out on Venice Beach on the 4th of July. And once the sun started to set, you know, we were drinking and doing drugs, playing volleyball and body surfing wild stuff like that and we decided that we were going to go to the Hong Kong Cafe now I failed to remember who was playing at the Hong Kong Cafe we got down there I ended up in the drunk tank in county jail and I don't remember what happened to the rest of the entourage but uh, <clears throat> on the way down there I had tried to leap out of the back seat of the car on the freeway and everybody was freaking out over there you know making a scene stupid drunk scene but we had a good time I'd, I'd hang with Darby a few times in the parking lot outside the new mask which is now where the Yoshihara is it beef bull on Santa Monica and Vine well, early germ shows were like, like, uh, you could expect anything to happen. It was more of, I would never got a feeling from a band, punk rock or otherwise, that had, I've never got the same feeling from any other band like the germs did. You can mention Black Flag, you can mention Flipper, you could mention the Dead Kennedys, any of those bands were really good punk rock bands, but the Germs seemed to have a certain spirit, which was like, the band could break out into a fight with the crowd, or a Mexican gang from down the street could storm in. And, uh, uh, the singer would be passed out, or, or like rolling around, not passed out, but rolling around the stage, and uh, not singing throughout the whole set. And, power could be shut off, the cops could show up, anything could have happened. It was more, but I felt that a lot of it stemmed from their music and the way it, it, it came from some kind of demonic place. It was like possessed. It was possessed. And the wire
Nicole. Listen, listen, shut up. Listen. Hey, listen. They're throwing us out. We'll do shutdown. Shutdown. Pat. Pat. stories from the old days, from the punk rock scene in Hollywood. This would be fun. How much do you know about Pat? Ah, uh, let's see. <laughs> hey, real quick. Is, is there anything that you're interested in learning about Lee before we walk in here? Um, I we both were a part of this scene early on, this punk rock thing in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. He at one point joins the Germs. Falling out from underneath the bar kind of reputation. We're sitting down with two LA punk rock icons, Pat Smear from the Germs and Lee Ming from Fear. First question was, I didn't know if you had ever played together or, you know, in and something that came to mind that I didn't think of till I was driving here is you guys were both obviously in decline of Western civilization. Right. And 30 years later, you're in another uh, documentary. See that full circle thing going on? Total. Uh, full circle, which uh, was yeah. a whole thing that Darby was the full circle. Yeah. And. Not here talking about it. Not here talking about it? <laughs> no, just not here. Right. But, um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. We didn't play at the same. No, I don't remember. Did you play at an actual club or did you have to play at a soundstage? We played at Larchmont Hall for, for, the, for Brendan. No, no, for the, uh, for the decline. That was at the Culver City Arena, where the main oh. footage, where Penelope shot oh. the main footage for our show. I remember, I was at that game. And it was, it was packed. Yeah. It was a great big room. And yeah. I remember saying to somebody, hey, motherfucker, don't bite so hard next time I come. And, yeah. you know, we're trying to make friends. <laughs> I would say to him, uh, it was... Fucking 1980. It's a fucking matter, man. You can't afford a haircut. Stuff like that. Yeah. Just endearing myself to people yeah. in, in that sort Making of making friends. Uh, interpersonal. <laughs> Making friends. That's right. <laughs> Ours wasn't. Uh, they wouldn't. At this point, they wouldn't let. No club would let us play. Right. Then no club would let us play. No. Either. Not the whiskey and not the Starwood, which is more. But most important. even worse for us was even our friends who were promoters wouldn't have us. So <laughs> we couldn't even do like the Red and Hall place. So Penelope had to actually rent a soundstage for us to play in. Penelope Vegas used show. our audience shots for, for all the bands. Really? Yeah. Because so whenever the crowd was too big, it's your shot. That's right. <laughs> and that show was packed. That was jam-packed at Culver City Arena. Ah. It was a big 2,000-person hall or something like that, and it was jam. So she used our audience shots for... And we also played in Redondo Beach at some club where the bags were being filmed that night, and Penelope was going to use their footage for that and some of, and some of our stuff from that night. But mostly it was Culver City Arena and one gig in Redondo Beach. Those were the two performances that she used for us in the decline. I don't remember the name of that Redondo club. How do you feel, or were you aware of, because you said, you know, fear was definitely more aggressive, at, at least to my perception, and had a more aggressive, like the slam dancing, and for lack of a better term, a more brutal audience 
than say the germs did? Is that true, or am I no, perceiving I it wrong? The germs are pretty, uh, I think our audiences were pretty similar. Yeah, pretty similar. Ours might have been a little. Maybe more, more Hollywood oriented, or maybe a little, little closer to the art scene or something. When we first started playing, they wouldn't let us play. They didn't think of us as a band. They, they booked us at uh, arts. They thought of us as, as performers art because we were so bad that they didn't really, really consider us a band. So we would play with opening for performance artists, and it wasn't until we got a little better that we started getting booked as a band in places that bands played. So we, I think we brought some of those. <laughs> I think there was interest on the Hollywood art scene in this scene, whatever this was going to be. They, uh, that group of people liked it. Steve it, was, it was great to see an actual music scene happening in Hollywood. You know, after it had only been industry bullshit for years and years. It had to be, uh, all you ever heard in the radio were the Doobie Brothers and things that sounded classic industry, safe, and no bad words, nothing. And finally somebody said to me, man, you gotta go look at this punk rock scene. I was down there at Brendan Mullins' place the other night. It's called The Mask, you gotta go look at this. Some guy was in there with a Led Zeppelin shirt, it looked like they were gonna kill him and beat the shit out of him. He was running out of there screaming, you gotta take a look at this thing. So I go down to The Mask and the first things I see with this awful band from Pasadena, a band that can't fucking play or do anything. Then another band comes up, they're even worse, and I'm thinking, oh, this is for shit, man. I can't fucking handle this. I'm into John Coltrane and Miles Davis. I can't fucking handle this, man. So I go back and give it one more shot. I go back the next night and I see Arthur J and the Gold, Club, Gold Cups, Black Randy and the Metro Squad, and uh, the Gears and the Controllers and who the fuck ever else. I can't even remember. I think, oh, okay, this is different. Black Randy comes up to the microphone and goes, I want to bother you to be a and the whole joint just started beating the <laughs> shit out of us. Yeah, man, I found my home, man. <laughs> those bands, like you were asking before, all those bands I mean, were so different. Like what we call punk rock. Nobody would call this stuff punk rock now. Like Black Man comes out now, no, or Arthur J. Especially, no one's going to call that punk rock. No one's going to call Devo punk rock now, or or so many of these bands that to us the go was like, yeah, these are punk rock bands, and then became so cookie cutter began to fall into the idea of uh, new wave versus punk. Like the that punk too. was the hardcore, the thing the record companies wouldn't have, yeah. the, the thing that Sid Vicious pisses on her boss's wife at A&M Records. So <laughs> you know, by Monday morning, nobody called punk rock is going to get signed by any wow. major labels anywhere. I heard that Sid ground a broken wine glass into Paul McCartney's guitar player's eye or something, oh. some horrific story like that. And uh, so, you know, the, there's these stories being told, and if you show up with anything having to do with the word punk attached to your name, the record companies don't want to talk to you. They don't want to listen to your shit. They throw it away immediately. So, and it's taken all these years for that to, stigma to go away and for people to finally listen. I wanted them to listen to us. We brought people in to see us. They were singing along with our songs to every word. I thought that was the last step before Clive Davis shows up with this big contract and signs <laughs> me up. <laughs> but the record labels weren't into it. And it's taken all this time for them to forget about that show yeah. and listen to what's being presented to them and judge on the basis of that, not on some thing that's hearsay. Um, we weren't starting bands to, to be indie and and uh, we weren't trying to, to have some sort of, like whatever's going on, whatever's happened later with like, no, it's cool, you want to be in there. We were doing that. We all wanted to be signed. We all actually wanted people to like and hear our bands. We became indie because we had, because nobody else would do it. So your friend would say, I'll figure out how to put out a record and I'll start a record label or whatever like that. But it, it became so like, yeah, indie DIY. I was like, no, that's not what we were doing. We were trying, we just failed, so we had to do something else. And we had to use indie labels because those are the only ones that would get involved with it. The only ones to take the chance, yeah. and invest some money. Thank you. Leaving. My pleasure. Pat Smear. A pleasure. We're sitting down and talking to us. Why don't the club owners hire the germs anymore? Mm, we do get shows occasionally, but it is getting harder. I think there's a lot of bands now 
and when we were first doing it, there weren't that many bands. And a lot of the new bands are just more cooperative as far as doing a sedate, safe stage show. There's no threat of um, an imminent riot. I've had promoters grab me and shake me and say, stop this show. It's on the verge of becoming a riot. Fucking beer. How did you get the reputation that you have? I guess we used to do stuff. I mean, back, you know, it was good to have that kind of reputation then, you know, but um, not anymore because now we can't play anywhere. Tell me, why, how, how is it that you're always getting hurt? Well, first I did on purpose. Yeah. To keep from being bored. He's come out of shows with huge scrapes and scratches and claw marks all over him and just pouring blood, but it always looks a lot worse than it is. What's the worst time you ever got hurt? Mm, the whisking. I cut my foot open. What happened? I came down the stairs to do, do an on course, and then I jumped on a half a broken glass like that, and I, I had to get like 30 stitches. So I was standing like right in front, and... I was looking at his face, and, and like you ended up sitting down on the ground, and you were holding your foot like this, and you looked at it, and, and you just started going, ah, you know, and then you stopped playing and stuff, and you were running around trying to find your tennis shoes. And I had to go to the hospital with blue hair and stuff, and they were bringing all the nurses in and stuff to look at me. Why do you get so loaded to perform? Because... That way I don't feel myself getting hurt. I mean, it's scary out there. No, it's real scary, like, because when we play, we're right down there in the audience, and there's lots of creeps out there. And there's lots of people that have grudges against us now, too. And so if I didn't get loaded, I wouldn't be able to do it. I just broke this egg. Well, we've tried everything. To get him to do that, I've to talked to him. To sing into the mic, it's just like almost like the enemy or something. Stay away from it at all costs, it seems. So tell me why you don't sing into the mic, Darby. Just don't pay attention to it. Once you load it. We tried everything short of gluing his mouth to it. Yeah, this mic's not working. Things get broken, monitors, mics, but you kind of have to expect that if you hire an energetic young band. Darby, pick up the mic. The mic. got together as a band, they didn't know how to play their instruments, and they did things to kind of camouflage that. Darby would smear peanut butter all over him. He'd dive through broken glass. He'd break glasses on his head. And eventually, they learned how to play. <laughs> Oh, 
Greg when you're on stage. <laughs> Anything? Usually I do um speed or something, and then that gets too nervous, so I do some kind of downers, and I start drinking. And say, give me a beer. Somebody give me a beer. Damn it! Somebody give me a beer. A beer. Damn it! A beer. Damn it! One of you give me a beer. Give me a beer, you fucking. Well, it's more like. Being the mother of four three-year-olds who are always um, fighting with each other, but not, not really seriously fighting, just he did this to me, she did this, I can't stand it. And sometimes I get the end of my rope and just want to batter my children. What happened to your throat? And we were at some party and we were taking pictures and... um. Shannon had like a switchblade like this, and I went like that, and like it, like this side just missed my jugular, and this side just missed my windpipe. Do you feel like you want to quit sometimes? Oh yes, almost all the time. Tell me about the painter. Oh, the dead painter. My parents were in China, and we were just finishing having the um, house painted, and Darby and Donnie. And Dinky, and Mark Plummer, and my brother were all at my house. And my brother and I went to take the trash out at like one in the morning or something. And we hadn't been out in the backyard. It was on a Tuesday. We hadn't been out in the backyard since um my parents left since like uh, the Friday before. And so, anyways, um I went outside and I must have walked right over the guy because I couldn't see anything, anyways. And then my brother, my brother goes to me, isn't there somebody sleeping in the backyard? And I just went, what? What are you talking about? And um, I went over and looked at him, and I was just joking. I went, this guy's dead. And I gave him a kick in the stomach, you know, and was dead. He was dead. My brother thought we killed him. He goes, what should we do? Like, should we hide the body or something? So anyways, um, we went and... Donnie had a camera, and we went and we lied down. I lied down next to him. We all got around, and we took a bunch of pictures, like family pictures, and we're all going, hi, you know, and taking pictures and stuff. What really happened to the guy? Um, they think he had a heart attack and fell off the ladder, and no one found him for a few days. <clears throat> it was really funny, actually. And the paramedics came, and they were joking with us, and the coroner came. Oh, remember and they all those jokes? Oh, yeah. What Instead were some of, of the John jokes? Doe, they put down Jose Doe because it was a wet back. Didn't you feel bad that the guy was dead? No. Not at all. Because I hate painters. <laughs> Melissa's song. Yeah. 
got to see. We really play. We really mean it. My name is John. John, John, Jack. Pass out at the fucking set. John C. They produced it. They produced it. When my ego falls so far, I don't know. at everybody I know at one time or another, but I've always ran afterwards because I'm, I can't fight. The police are all calling me names and they made me take a shower because they said I smell and they asked me why I don't wash my clothes more often. I probably hit lots of girls in the face. I don't like girls very much. Is the time up now? From Huntington Beach, thrashed on my nose. Look at my nose. Look at it. All right? I didn't do nothing to their shit. They fucking grab me like this and they go hippie. It was an accident. There was no accident. I'm just saying, we know who he is. When he comes back here, we're going to get his ass. Was it easy to sneak into the mask? Sometimes there was someone here taking money, but oh yeah, you know, if you knew people, you were pretty much always in. Yeah, there any so there was the bands, a guest, there was a guest. Hardly anybody wasn't in one of the bands. Oh, no. can, you feel, can you feel the energy? So where did you, where did you actually try out from the Right here. Now I'm out. Eating. How did you fit a drum set right here by the urinal? It's kind of a small drum set. I just set it up, just like it was a little sonar kit, you know, like a four-piece kit. And I just set it up. I had huge Tama stands that I bought with my trust fund that I moved here with. It was all my twelve hundred dollar trust fund. That's did, that, that's what I got my apartment with. Was Pat Milana playing with you or? No, nobody was playing with me. I was just in here by myself playing drums. I didn't know how to play the drums. I just went, oh, no. and I just banged on them and made a bunch of noise, and they were just looking at me really weird. And I was just like, oh, God, what are you going to do? I go, well, do you like, know a song or something? So I played Life of Crime by the Weirdos because Nicky Beat had just caught it to me like a couple days before, and it was the only song I sort of knew how to play. So I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, this is 
something that you really put here in the dam for the water, destroy the glass water. to ask you what's what it's like playing with these guys and so as opposed to playing with your previous group oh it's kind of the same well <laughs> that's good that's good uh, you mean uh, you call me darby <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's got the same problem <laughs> oh gee i hope not i hope that's not true so. <laughs> darby passed away by him. yes he did uh it's no accident how was that? And and what did you how did you handle like your career after that? Well, it wasn't much of a career. We all, you know, we knew that the writing I mean, was on the wall. You've heard the germs, right? I mean, yeah. you've heard the album, which is like this amazing document. It's a great thing. As Richard Meltzer called it a musical strip mine of the soul, mm. which is fairly accurate except for the musical. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, it's it, it, there was no one going to play that on the real radio. We yeah. knew it. We we were totally into world domination, but we knew if that that meant something else. It didn't mean like we were going to get airplay and we were right. going to be big in the music biz. We knew that wasn't going to happen. Yeah, and we didn't care. We did a, a different thing. It was like a shamanic fucking um, thing, you know. <laughs> it really was. It was. It, it's hard to describe what it was, but it wasn't like anything else. There was no music business about it. There was no um trying to be cool about it there was no trying to be rock and roll like everyone was right then you know right. lester bangs and everything there was none of that <clears throat> there was there was nothing you know there, it was just this whole unique thing that darby had this power this charisma that nobody else had because he knew how to he did a lot of acid and he went to this innovative public school 
um, innovative program school which at, at the high school that he and Pat went to. They, they both went to it. Uh, it was IPS at Uni High. And it was this weird thing. It would never happen now. But it was the 70s. So it was like this, this program that you could get into. And it was like EST meets Scientology, but for high school kids. Hmm. It was insane. Like, I guess the first, I mean, you know, read my book. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot about it. And then I interviewed the main guy, Fred Holpe, who was like the, the leader of I, IP, IPS, Innovative Program School. First day, <clears throat> the kids got there. They sat in a semicircle, cross-legged on the floor. He had these little Bibles, you know, and he threw them at, at each person. He'd throw one to a girl. And he goes, here, cunt. And he'd throw one to a guy. He goes, here, cock. <clears throat> you know? Wow. This is not something that people would expect to be in their high schools normally. Yeah. Um, but then Darby kind of started his own weird cult uh, uh, of his own personality in there and ended up <clears throat> brainwashing uh, Fred Holtby, the leader guy's kid. And that hit the, so the, the leader guy's kid was Darby's disciple. Wow. Yeah, so it was weird. But he... You know, wait, wait, what, what was he... What was... His Darby could, manifesto, or Darby whatever. could talk. I don't know. You could just Darby. <clears throat> Darby could talk to cops on ten hits of acid, and, <laughs> you know, and it was fine. Yeah, he'd bend them to his will. So he was just. Uh, he had the gift of gab. He had a gift of everything. He was super smart. He'd just see right through everything and 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 get to the core of it instantly. No yeah. bullshit. And yeah. he was hilarious too. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's always portrayed as some serious guy. It was not like that. <clears throat> I never heard him raise his voice in anger once. Why was he so depressed then? I don't know. He had like daddy issues and big brother died issues and all this fucked up things from, from his childhood. But, but he was a brilliant, <clears throat> brilliant guy. Like he read so much stuff. He's so well read. He, 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 he was like everyone like was affected by him. You couldn't not love Darby. You know, it was like a Jesus kind of character, hmm. or like like Hitler was supposed to be, except for like he didn't kill anybody yeah. except himself. <clears throat> but like it, it was like so charismatic. He was so charismatic that even the people that supposedly hated him wanted him to like them. Yeah. So I've never met anybody that with that kind of of power. You know that yeah. that kind of magic. Yeah. He had it, and there's, that comes along very rarely in yeah. the world. And all, I think one of the things that made him so totally powerful in ways that other people weren't was he had no fear of death. In fact, he welcomed it. Bring it on. You know, mm. he, he, he wanted it. Mm. It was cool. That yeah. was great. He had this five-year plan that I never really understood, but uh, I guess it worked out to five years after he said he had the five-year plan when he killed himself. And uh, how was he? How was he found? Well, the way it happened too was weird. He kicked me out of the band, you know. Um, <clears throat> he sent Bill Bartell, our friend, over to my place to tell me I was out of the band, and that was a surprise. He wanted to get his little um, boy toy, Rob Henley, who was this cute young gigolo uh, skater kid from Huntington Beach. Um, who you'd always see in a Ferrari driving by on Highland and Franklin with some beautiful Beverly Hills chick, you know, with a credit card and, and her <laughs> dad's Ferrari. You know, but <clears throat> it was like, whoa, dude. And, but, but Darby was all really into this guy. And, he, and, and he, he, the guy wanted to play drums in the germs. And he said, okay. Yeah. And so he kicks me out. And, then, and, he, and he tells Pat and Lorna when he went to England with Amber, who had become his manager. That's a whole other story. <clears throat> but um, he said, well, I'm going to England, so uh, uh, Robbie's a germ now. Show him the songs. He went to England to, you know, basically get blown away by Adam Ant and want to become him. And um, he stayed there for, like, weeks. And Pat and Lorna tried to show Rob the songs. Amber, Darby's manager, had bought Robbie a drum set because she mm. had money. And um, <clears throat> he couldn't play at all. Like, not even, like, how I played after one week, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so, and Lorna just, and Pat were looking at each other. It's like, we're not, they don't want to go back to the pre-dawn times. Yeah. Because I took it to a new place. Pat and I would just vibe. And, and, and Pat said, before dawn, it always seemed weird playing with drummers. It always just seemed weird. And with dawn, everything just seemed normal. Right. It just seemed regular. Right. 
and uh, it was true. I, I got what they were trying to do, you know. Yeah. And um, I could do it. And so Pat and I would like goad each other on to play faster. I go, uh, he goes, that was good. Can you do it faster? I'm like, yeah. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. So we'd do it faster, and that's how it got like that. So the germs were banned from a lot of clubs. But it was or... slow when I joined the band. Yeah. Like, their songs were slow. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I don't know. I was hyperactive, so they got fast. <laughs> was there a specific incident in, at when a germ we show that things would happen at the shows sometimes? Yeah. Um, you know, kids would show up and they'd vandalize the club, maybe, or something like that. You know, it was never anything really scary or really fucked. You know, there was no guns. Yeah. There was no any crazy violence. Yeah. You know? Like I said, it was more of a shamanic ritual yeah. involving the Darby up there just sort of as this Christ figure. Uh, like, for, I don't know what happened, but this catharsis happened in the room while we played, and then it was done when we were done. And it, yeah. And it was unlike anything else. Like Sounds I said. like that psych chord I was telling you about a little it bit. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't yeah. just about music. You know, it yeah. wasn't like we were trying to do music. Yeah. Although the songs were good. And Darby's lyrics were great, but it really wasn't about anything like that. Um, who, who of you knew uh, uh, Darby Crash? All of you, yeah. What uh, kind of uh, guy was he? I looked up to him. Thought he was a genius. I thought he was real smart. Every everything he said to me, I thought was pretty intelligent. Except sometimes when he was all wasted, he was just utter <laughs> bullshit. But. I, I thought he was a pretty smart guy, and I thought he just like let his <clears throat> life go to waste just by killing himself. Just kind of selfish in a way, yeah. but very selfish. He was, yeah. There's no idols, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. in punk rock, you know. And there's no in the LA scene. There's been a lot of talented musicians, but Darby was someone who people looked up to, and who start he started <coughs> trends, and he was he was real. People really looked up to him and the fact that he was so talented in the music he did. And um, it, is, it is a shame, you know, because he was really cool. He was a little bit too much into drugs, but then mm -hmm. everybody is, you know. He's just like one of a kind person, someone you'll right. never meet again. No, no one, there's no one that could be like him at all, you know. I don't, I don't think he let people get too close to him, though. Yeah, cause he, he, I think he knew he, that he wanted to kill himself. I'm, I don't know. But I don't think he let people get too close to him. He didn't want Maybe. people like him too much yeah. or they yeah. get too attached yeah. because he knew what he was going to do, supposedly. Yeah. Darby and I were like, um, we were really close friends. And um, we were really, really close. Darby, the best way to put it is that Darby protected me more than more than anybody else ever has in my life and more than he ever did for anybody it, for um, most of the time it was like girls always protecting him oh no Darby you can't have that knife oh no Darby you can't do this oh no Darby you should never own a motorcycle oh no Darby you're gonna come with me right now you know and I never did that I was more like um, he didn't tell me what to do because he felt I was really intelligent he just um, he just sort of made sure nothing happened to me. He, uh, you know, one time we were walking into the Starwood and this girl said something and it was like so like, I don't, I don't pay any attention to what people say anymore. And he, he was like a few steps behind me and uh, he, um, I got up to the door and I said, where the hell, you know, he comes running up and he goes, where were you? And he goes, I go, well, what do you mean where was I? He goes, I just hit this girl for you. And I go, what'd you do that for? And he goes, well, she said something about you. And I said, well, what did she say? And he goes, I don't know. I just, she just said something. So I went back and hit her. I went, God, would you just, that's a little embarrassing. You know, don't do that. But he was really good to me. It was after, like after the germs played the last time. I mean, all the people that I've gone out with and hung around with and everything, what happened was um, 
we, I was in the dressing room. First, they weren't going to let me in. And I said, what are you going to do, leave me standing out here alone? I really am with Darby. And I went in, and I was sitting in the back of the room, and he just, like, opened the door really fast. And in front of all these people, he goes, Casey, where's Casey? Where is she right now? And I, I said, right here. And he, like, threw his arms around me and kissed me. And he said, don't worry, I've got drugs. And here's the money. Go, you know, divide it. And he trusted me that way, you know. He, um, he like, really believed in me. And, um... It was something, we had the same kind of mood swings. We would, like, if we were drinking, we'd forget the same things, and we'd remember the same things, and it was really a joke, you know. It was a joke at the time, the fact that we, you know, both went up and down at the same time. But what, um, but that was also what was to hurt us. And um, we'd been, like, kidding around about it. You know, we always did about, you know, how we would kill ourselves and, you know, stuff like that. And then the time came and, um, and we did it and he died. Um, there are a lot more details. You know, he died, but I didn't. I mean, I did technically die for about three minutes. I think uh, two and a half, three minutes. I read the police report. And um, for me... It was really hard because, see, a lot of people said the general feeling was that Darby didn't mean for me to die. And um, he didn't mean for me to die and that he did it on purpose and stuff like that, which is untrue. Um, he did mean for me to die because I was dead for a few minutes. We'd worked out already that the drugs moved slower through my veins because we'd done drugs and we'd known what was going on. And I don't understand uh, why... Why you both did decide uh, to die? We talked about suicide before, um, and we talked about committing suicide together before, but not in a serious way. But a lot of stuff you say isn't exactly always in like a heavy, serious, you know, in bed kind of conversation. Some of it's just a conversation, and we just we both just looked at each other, and the night was just like so. It was just such a bad night, and we just and once we left, we said we told people we're going, we're going to go kill ourselves, you know, that's it. We said it like nobody believed us, you know. But once that had been done, we were just like, you know, going, and we, and we got started, and we were doing it. And people really have doubts about the fact of whether, you know, we really thought we were going to die. People will swear to me that Darby doesn't think he was going to die, and I know for a fact that he wanted to die. You know, he wrote. He wrote a suicide note thinking he was going to die. He knew how much drugs he was doing, and he did think he was going to die. And he did also think that I was going to die. I had to realize, like, I woke up in the arms of a of a dead man. A lot of people like have this thing about how he laid himself out like a cross, which he didn't. His arms were around me, you know, and it's like, it's a very frightening feeling if that's the way you wake up. And that's the one person who's like, you know, loves you. You know, it's like very, it was very, very hard for me. And um, that's, I'm still getting over it. The hardest thing is not having the support of your friends, I guess. I have to pull myself together. Not anybody else can. And and somebody, you know, they ask me all the time about wanting to die. And I can honestly say there is not a moment that I'm awake, and there's not a moment that I uh, know when I'm going on that I that I don't wish that I had died that that night, you know. But um, but since I didn't, I'm not going to sit alone in my room and cry about it. What is the legacy of Darby Crash for you personally? He's one of like probably the three people in my life I was really that close to and uh, okay here's personal my son was conceived the night he died so you know his name's Alexander Jan Paul Rossler because 
It was just too crazy and weird. I mean, I still dream about him. He was just one of the people that you meet in your life that makes such an impact. And they're so important to you that, I mean, all of this is great, but he would be that person to me anyway, you know? There's certain people that come through once in a while that are magic. And if they're taken away from you, that leaves a bigger impact. It really does. Because you remember them exactly the way they were. I mean, there's still Lorna and Pat and Dawn and everyone who I'm so close to. And uh, I mean, I was like fifth wheel with that band. I went everywhere with them. I went, you know, to San Francisco with them. I went here. I, every time they played, I was on stage. It was, you know, if there was a band I had to pick that, that was the band that was it for me, they, they're, they're it. And the amazing thing is, I'm still doing it. It's, it had to mean something, because everywhere they go, I'm still there. You know, and we're still friends. And so big impact, major. I mean, they're part of my life. This is Darby Crash, one of the first to be involved in the punk scene in L.A. According to him, punkers are... Just having fun. Darby's contempt for society and his disdain for the value of life led to his participation in a mock game of suicide where participants competed by continuing to take sleeping pills until one of them chickens out. Darby did not chicken out. He took too many sleeping pills, and this led to his death. And the day before John Lennon was killed, local band leader Darby Crash committed the ultimate violent act, suicide, an overdose of heroin.